Good evening, everyone. Just giving it a few moments for people to join us. But it's wonderful to be connected again. Wow, I can't believe we finished the last course and starting a new one now. And I'm just checking to see that. Um, oh, yay. It's lovely to see folk connecting. It's wonderful. Just too wonderful. Bless you all so much. <coughs> We'll just give it a minute just to connect with everybody and to see everybody and wait for people to just get on. Lovely. Put my phone off <laughs> so we don't hear two voices going. Sure. Thank you, Jesus. <clears throat> well, I'm really excited to be teaching this course tonight. I must say it's because I have felt a weightiness in my heart. To be able to equip with new eyes, for people to see with new eyes and to be able to see things and to be able to become aware of seeing things from a different perspective. And so I really am trusting for the anointing of the prophet to be working in this course. The Bible says if you receive a prophet, you receive a prophet's reward. And the prophet's reward is that eyes are open to see what they couldn't see before. So that's my prayer. That's my prayer for everyone who is slotted in to this course. I'm just checking the time to see if it's, yes, it's time. <clears throat> Good evening, everyone who's just joined in. It's just amazing to be able to connect with you. There goes my cuckoo clock again at 7 o'clock. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, it's just amazing. To be able to be with you it's amazing to be spending time with you i must say that i've been really excited about teaching this course i trust that you will learn from it my heart has been in the fact that god said 2020 was a new era and it was the time of seeing things differently and he hasn't let me move away from the prophetic word for this year he hasn't let me move away from that which he is wanting to establish and just looking at the way people have responded and reacted to the season that we've been in, it's been very obvious that for many of us, um, we haven't been prepared for what we are in, what we're facing, and where we're going. And so my heart's desire through this course is to open your eyes to see what you haven't seen before and to help you to grow into a new place in Jesus and to be able to be prepared for the season that lies ahead for what we are going to be facing, but also to be those unshakable people who are rooted on the rock of Jesus Christ, that when the storms come, they cannot be shaken. I would like to just start with a prayer, just to usher in his glory and his presence. Ooh. So wherever you are, I just want to pray for you tonight. Oh, Father, what a privilege to be able to share your word publicly over the airwaves, that people can hear the truth, can receive the truth, can allow the truth to adjust their hearts, and can allow you, Holy Spirit, to do everything that you desire, so that we can be the people that you want us to be, and we can be the people that you're coming back for, your bride without spot or wrinkle. I pray that eyes are opened. I pray for such an anointing on people's eyes to see what they've never seen before. I also ask Holy Spirit, the truth sets us free, but the truth will always offend anything that we believe that's not true. So in the, in the revelation of truth, I pray for hearts that will receive quickly and will adjust quickly for the breakthrough that you are wanting for your children, for the bride of Christ, for the body of Christ. Bless every single person. Brood, Holy Spirit. Let your presence brood in their homes. Let your presence brood. I speak peace. I speak order. I take authority over chaos. I take authority over the airwaves. I thank you for such clear communication. And I want to thank you, Father God, that, that the whole atmosphere within every home will be the atmosphere of the presence of, him, of heaven. Righteousness, peace, and joy. In the incredible Holy Spirit. Thank you, Father. Amen. Well, I am, was very rushed in the last course. I felt that I had so much to share and so much to tell you, and I never had enough time to unpack it. 
So I must be honest, there were times that I felt I didn't do it justice. There was much more that I could have shared and I felt I was rushed. I don't want to rush this time. I would rather take a little longer and explain things clearly and um, pray that people's eyes are open and that there's revelation. So um, I just want to welcome everyone tonight. I know we've got people watching that haven't watched before. My name is Kathleen De La Hunt. It's an absolute honor to be talking to you tonight. It's an absolute honor to be sharing with you tonight. And the course that we are doing is called Seeing Life Through New Eyes. And this is part one. And I'm going to be starting tonight by looking at the reason that I felt God say, teach my people to see differently. So the prophetic word for 2020 that God gave me and many other prophets, one of the parts, one of the sentences was that we were moving into a new era <clears throat> and God was opening eyes to see as they've never seen before. The cover on this book says, we do not see things the way they are. We see them the way we are. I want you to understand that none of us honestly see the truth. The, 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 the truth, the only truth there really is, is the truth of the Word of God and the truth of the Holy Spirit. And that is why we all see in part, we all see things from our perspective. We see things from our understanding. We see things from the neural parts that have been established in our mind. We believe they're truth, but they're not truth. They're only our truth. And so it's really, really important that as we listen to this teaching, as it unpacks and as I share things with you, do not be offended if I say something you may not like. Rather take it, think about it, pray about it, and ask God to reveal to you what the truth is. Because He is the truth. The Word of God is the truth. What happened there, but we cut off. I'm trusting that you are going to be able to see now. Um, for those that were cut off, I suppose you've got to reconnect again. I'm just going to wait a moment to see if you have. Um, yes, let's see if people have managed to reconnect again. I'm so sorry about that. I have no idea what happened, but it just cut off. So hopefully we are back on. Yes. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Sorry. I pray, Father God, this will not cut off again. Well, let's start again. So seeing through new eyes, uh, I felt to, that God is wanting us to teach this because of the fact that the word for 2020 was the fact that God said it was a new era and that we would be seeing things differently. And it is important and vital that we see things differently. In this time of shaking, God has very clearly said things are never going to go back the way they were. And therefore, we have to have a new perspective on what God is busy doing, on what is happening in the angelic realm, on what is happening in the demonic realm, and on how we ourselves can be prepared for that which as God is preparing us for. And God is preparing us in a way where we're going to walk one day at a time, one step at a time, and we're going to be reliant on the whisper of God. And so it's vital that we start seeing things from God's perspective and not from our own perspective. I said just before we were cut off, that we all just see in part, nobody sees the full truth. The only truth there is, is the truth of the Word of God and the Holy Spirit that is truth. Every other one of us see our own measure of truth. That is why that you'll get a whole lot of people being a witness to some tragedy that happened. And at the end of the day, you get so many different stories, you won't know how to, who to believe. Because everybody records and speaks according to what they've received. I rushed through the last course and I really want to take this one slower because I want to make sure people understand because I feel it's vital to be able to understand what God is wanting us to know differently in the time that runs ahead. And so Father God, as I prayed in the first section, I pray for eyes to be opened. I pray for your anointing in this place and in every single house. And I pray for revelation. I pray that the seven, the seven spirits before the throne from Isaiah 11 verse 1 will be brooding in the homes. I want to pray for a spirit of revelation, a spirit of wisdom, a spirit of understanding, a spirit of counsel, the spirit of the Lord, a spirit of might, and the spirit of the fear of the Lord to grip our hearts and minds as we listen and receive what it is that you have for us to receive. In Jesus' mighty name. Thank you, Lord. Well, if I were to give you an example of this, if you took a small town person who lived in a little village 
and and they have the, the the amount of people living in the village is not very big and they have a meeting at the town council and you say to them were there a lot of people there and there may have been about 30 people that person's response will be it was amazing it was so well supported <coughs> and in that group there was a visitor from a big city and if you went to that person from the big city and you say was this meeting well supported the person from the big city would say no there was just a handful of people who was telling the truth they both were they were both telling the truth from their own perspective so truth has a very loose foundation if our truth isn't built on that which is the word of God and so I want to talk tonight about what is your perspective what do you see what is your truth and is that actually the truth that God is wanting you to see and maybe we've got to start seeing things through new eyes in the season that lies ahead because God wants to deal with us in a different way and he's opening our spiritual emotional and physical eyes to see things we've never seen before in Revelation 3 verse 18 it says and this is this is Jesus talking to the Laodicea church the end time church us our church he says I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in fire so that you can become rich and white clothes to wear so that you can cover your shameful nakedness and solve ointment to put on your eyes so that you can see so he says to the Laodicea church pay the cost I counsel you to come and buy what does it mean to buy it means to pay the cost to pay for that which you are wanting pay the cost it says um for gold to become rich the gold the refined gold is the glory of God it's when we've gone through the refiner's fire until we receive the full glory we've been glorified into the fullness of our predestined state he says pay the cost to get there then he says white clothes white clothes right throughout the Bible from Isaiah 61 right through to the end always talks about robes of righteousness he says pay the cost to get your robes of righteousness and then he says solve your eyes anoint your eyes so that you can see what you haven't seen before we have to ask God to give us his perspective and to see things from a different place seeing and doing things differently can only happen when a person changes their perspective you know friends when we do things the same time every single time and we're expecting a different result it's never going to happen because to get a different result we have to do things differently we have to reason differently and we've got to think differently Ephesians 1 verse 18 I've told you before I absolutely love Ephesians I think for anybody who doesn't know where to start in the Bible just study Ephesians it's such an amazing handbook for the end time church Ephesians 1 18 says the eyes of your understanding being enlightened that you may know the eyes of your understanding being enlightened being opened up so that you may know that word know means to perceive with your eyes to perceive with your senses so it's far more than just seeing it's actually perceiving with your eyes and your senses understanding discerning discovering experiencing and being skilled in so God is wanting us to experience new things he's wanting us to see new things he's wanting us to sense new things he's wanting us to discern and remember the gift of discernment is always to separate what is God what is the enemy what is demonic what is angelic what is the heart of man and and it saddens me to say that the discernment is greatly lacking in the body of Christ there are very few people that I've met that are truly discerning they cannot read and they cannot perceive is this God is this the enemy is this man or is this angelic activity or demonic activity and so I pray right now that the eyes of your understanding will be opened and that you will be enlightened to know with perception that word know means to experience and to actually have a revelation that becomes part of you <coughs> it's not just having intellectual knowledge intellectual knowledge is information that hasn't changed anything in your life it's a head full of stuff that causes chaos confusion and busyness God wants us to have the revelation that goes into our soul and it becomes part of who you are so that what you operate in what comes out of you what overflows from you is the understanding of the knowing 
what God has got. It's a gift of the Holy Spirit. Then it goes on to say, what are we meant to know? What is the hope of his calling? Friends, in this time, God wants us to know hope. He wants, it means the expectation of good. Sons of God always see from the position of expecting good. I'm going to say that again. Sons of God, mature children of God, prophets, prophetic people, sons of God always see things from the place of expecting good. That is called hope. And it is the expectation of the good of our calling and the riches of the glory of our inheritance. Friends, we have a glorious, rich inheritance. And we have to start seeing things differently. Every time we go, oh, that's terrible. We've just opened ourselves up to a spirit of fear. The end time, the Bible says that people's hearts will fail them because of fear. It's not our position to be in fear, friends. It's our position to be in peace. And God says, do not be afraid. Do not be shaken. All these things will happen. But you do not be shaken. Do not be fearful. The one who's built his house on the rock cannot be shaken when the storms come. We have to have the atmosphere of the kingdom of heaven within us. Righteousness, peace, and joy. And how can we have that? Only when we know unshakably right down deep in our spirit, operating through our soul, that we have the revelation and the knowledge of hope in everything God is doing. Because God is in control. And I want to tell you this, God is in control. God said that the shaking was him. Now, he didn't bring corona. He brought shaking. The enemy uses a portal to try and get his will to be done. But this is not the only shaking, friends, and we have to know how to come into this and how to understand and how to be able to cope with everything that we have to face into the future. We are the last church. We are the bride he's coming back for. We are the ones that he has been waiting for since the day Jesus left. He's been waiting for us. Isn't that amazing? Isn't it exciting? Do you know when a bridegroom is waiting for the bride or the bride is waiting for the bridegroom, the excitement just gets stronger and stronger and stronger. Do you know how excited heaven is? Do you know how excited the angels are? Do you know how excited they are setting the table, preparing for the bride? Do you know the excitement that's operating in heaven right now? Because he's coming back so soon. To change the way we see, we have to reposition ourselves. You know, friends, too many people are under circumstances. If you're under circumstances, you're in the wrong place. Because if the kingdom of, of this earth is where we live, and circumstances are controlled by the kingdom of darkness, when we are under circumstances, we're under the wrong kingdom. But we've got to be seated with Christ in heavenly places, which is the third heaven above the kingdom of darkness. And when we shift position. I often say to people when they say to me, yeah, I'm fine under the circumstances. I say, well, change position. Get out from under the circumstances. What are you doing there? Why are you submitting yourself to something you don't have to? We have to change position, friends. We have to be seated with Christ in heavenly places. We've got to see things from above and not from below. We're not under something that is pressing us down and overwhelming us and, and, and overpowering us and causing us to be hopeless, helpless, and foolish. We are positioned with Christ in heavenly places and we look down at what is happening and we see from his perspective. And that's when we see with new eyes. Ephesians 1 verse 19b to 21 and then 2 verse 6 says, the power is the same as the mighty strength he who exerted when he raised Christ from the dead. We have the same power of the Spirit of God that raised Christ from the dead living in us. Do you understand that? The power that raised Christ from the dead is living in you. You are full of the power that raises dead things. It goes on to say, and seated him on his right hand, um, in the heavenly realm, far above all rule and authority, all principalities and powers. Jesus is seated above every principality and every power that is operating and, and establishing itself right now. Do you understand that? 
He's not shaken. He's not surprised. He's looking from the top down. He's saying they're playing their best game. They're doing their best. But he is sitting above that, watching it happening with the final chess piece, the king in his hand. He is the king of kings. And he hasn't played his card yet. And it goes on to say he's far above the principalities and powers. You know, it's like they look like little ants below. It's like, how ridiculous is this? Because that's how far above he is positioned, above everything that's being plotted, and above every ploy of the evil one, and above every bit of wickedness of men, and above every ploy of people trying to control, and trying to take authority, and trying to establish man-made rules. God is mightily above that, and so is Jesus, looking down at these feeble ants wearing themselves out under the control of demons. Um. It says, uh, far above all rule, authority, principalities, and power, and dominion, and every name that's invoked, not only in the present age, this world, but also in the age to come. He is already in authority over every name that is coming now and in the age to come. We have to start seeing things with new eyes, friends. We have to see what we've never seen before. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. Do you have any understanding where you're seated? If you are under circumstances today, I want to say this to you. Change position. Change position. Get out from under them. Be seated with Christ and see what he's doing. Because, my friend, for too long we've lived a life that says this is happening to me. When God says, no, it's happening for you. Because you have to see that when we have hope, there's always the expectation of this is going to be turned to good. God's going to be glorified and I'm going to benefit. So this is not happening to you. And it doesn't matter where you are and what your circumstances are. It's happening for you, for greater glory. So the first thing I want you to say to whoever's with you in the room, this is not happening to me. It's happening for me. I am the benefactor. I'm going to be benefiting because of everything that's happening at the moment. We have to have our eyes enlightened to see what God sees. When we see from God's perspective, we see ourselves as he sees us. We see our partner as he sees them. We see our loved ones as he sees them. We see the lost as he does. We see the times as he does. We see circumstances as he does. We see opportunities, friends. We see our destiny as he does. To change perspective, we have to deal with our own heart first. So, how do we do that? Well, 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 23 says, And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. I pray God, I pray your whole spirit, I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless until the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. We have to present our bodies to the Lord. We've got to bring our spirit, our soul, and our body to him, the whole of who we are. And we've got to allow him to work within so that we can be blameless before him. Sorry, I'm getting um, messages coming through. Okay. I love this little picture. I just had to put it in because it's so graphic and I'm a very picture person. I see everything in pictures and visions. So I'd love to find pictures to demonstrate what I see. And here we see our Fred Bassett says, hey, what's going on here? Because suddenly his thought bubble is a, tri a triangle. Now that's not right. He says when it's a rectangle, nor is that he says when it's a circle. And he says, I'm having great difficulty getting my thoughts into shape today. And you know what, friends? The greatest onslaught in this day and age is against our mind. And we have to know how to get our thoughts into shape every single day. And I love this little picture because it just made it so clear to see how we're meant to be dealing with our thoughts and deciding who's in charge of your thoughts, friends. Who has control of your mind? Take back your control. You know, many years ago, um, we went to go and watch a, a, a Disney we went to Disneyland, my family and I, and it was about two, uh, 1999, and we went to Disneyland. My girls were still teenagers, and we had the most amazing time in Disneyland. 
And I must tell you, I was there. We were there as a family from 10 o'clock in the morning until they shut the doors at midnight. We were going to get our full of Disneyland. And it was the most amazing time, wonderful experience. Just loved it. Loved the family time. Loved the rides. We were crazy on the rides. And at midnight, they had a light um, extravaganza. They did a, a big show on the water with extremely exquisite lights and a story that they told around Mickey Mouse. And Mickey Mouse came on as the character, and in the beginning of the extravaganza, everything was beautiful. You saw the, you saw uh, all the beautiful dancers and all the princesses, and you saw a boat going past. But everything was lovely and peaceful and wonderful. And all the all the Disney characters that were good Disney characters were coming past on the little boats, and they were waving and they were dancing, and there was just such beauty and joy and the feeling of, oh, how nice is this. And suddenly the music changed and the first bad character came on and it was a witch. And then there was another demonic thing that came on and every single evil um, character of Disney at that point of time just flashed across and came to attack. And there was war and there was chaos and there was confusion and the waters were rough and everything changed. The whole picture changed from this peaceful, calm, beautiful picture everything and the lights were flashing and it was extravagant and it was elaborate and it was scary and everything became chaotic and suddenly mickey mouse stood up and he said stop this is my imagination and i'm taking it back and you know that was the most powerful demonstration i have ever seen of taking your thoughts captive and i want to say this to you friends you have authority over your thoughts. Your thoughts belong to you. Your mind belongs to you. When the enemy comes and he brings thoughts that bombard, that bring chaos, that bring torment, that bring lust, that bring condemnation, when he comes at you, remember, he comes at you. How do you know he's come? Because the atmosphere changes. Everything becomes chaotic. You have the authority to say, I will not tolerate this. And you don't go into warfare with the enemy and you don't waste your enemy quoting five million scriptures and you don't waste your enemy repenting for the fact that these thoughts are bombarding your head because they are not your thoughts. You just rise up and say, I will not allow squatters into my mind. It is my mind and I will control my mind and I have my mind dedicated to Jesus. And then you shut the window. They can be shouting outside, but you fix your eyes on Jesus. You fix your eyes on the author and finisher of your faith. You focus in on Christ and don't just ignore them. I want to tell you the one thing the enemy hates more than anything else is to be ignored. Oh, man. Kian. <laughs> if, if if I can't get this working now, then I'm just going to carry on. Well, I'm just started again. Let's see. I don't know why this is cutting off, but um, thank you. Take authority in the name of Jesus. It's obviously the the the, the internet tonight. Um, I'm so sorry about this, guys, but I'm going to carry on anyway. So, um, wow. Yes. Take three. Let's see how far we get. All right, so I was saying that we have to take our, th our thoughts captive. We are the God. We are the ones that are in control of our thoughts. And we submit our thoughts to the Spirit of God. And I want to say to you, friends, it is vital, vital that you don't give anybody else, any spirit, any demon, any authority, any voice of man, the right to your mind. It is vital. Okay, so three things are common for every single person. I am, I hope you can see me now. I hope that this has got a picture. Thank you. Take our, our thoughts captive. We are the God. We are the ones that are in control of our thoughts. And we submit our thoughts to the Spirit of God. And I want to say to you, friends, it is vital, vital that you don't give anybody else, any spirit, any demon, any authority, any voice of man, the right to your mind. It is vital. Okay. So three things are common for every single person. I am, I hope you can see me now. I hope that this has got a picture. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I hope this has got a picture. Well, let's go from here. All right. 
I'm going to carry on and just see how it goes. Right. Jesus, thank you that the screen will last. Everybody is born with three things in common. The first thing is that they are born in continent. The next thing that we see is that they are born absolutely selfish. Babies are born completely selfish, and we have to recognize that they are born all about me, and they are born completely self-centered. So selfish means everything is for me. Self-centered means everything is about me, and I'm in the center of the universe, and everything revolves around me. You just have to spend a day in the presence with a baby, a newborn baby, and you will realize very quickly they are completely incontinent, completely selfish, and completely self-centered. And then God gives us parents to be able to bring us into maturity. Now, the word self-control means to be continent. Did you know that? Isn't that quite vulgar to think about it? Because self-control means be continent. Take control of your body, your soul, and your spirit. Don't allow yourself to be somebody that operates incontinently. Now, we see that physically babies need to be potty trained. And parents and caregivers spend a lot of time getting them potty trained to get them off the nappies and to get them out of the place where they are um, being. And I mean, children that, that are not potty trained are extremely tiring and they make a mess. I mean, the most incredible thing is when you pick up and I've got seven grandchildren and with all of them, when you pick them up and you hold them and they soil themselves, inevitably they soil themselves all over you as well. So we see this physical thing of being incontinent and we get them physically continent as soon as we can. There's a next thing and that is about becoming continent spiritually. Now, everybody needs to grow to be restored back to their father. And when we come as Christians, we are spiritually incontinent. Because none of us have been equipped in the way that we should go um, in the things of God. And so we come to the Father spiritually in continence. And it's our responsibility to grow. It says in Hebrews 5 verse 12 to 14. In fact, though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you the elementary truths of God, of God's word all over again. You need milk, not solid food. Anyone who lives on milk being still an infant is not acquainted with the teachings about righteousness. But solid food is for the mature, who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good and evil. You see, friends, one of the signs of being a mature, spiritually mature Christian is that you have discernment. And so if we do not have discernment, we are not mature Christians. We are children spiritually. And I want to say this to you. It is vital that the body of Christ grows in discernment. We cannot face the future if we do not grow in discernment. We have to learn what is God, what is not God, which prophetic words of God. Do you understand that the deception that is coming against us, this church, is coming through prophets and through messiahs? Do you understand that it is vital to know which words are God's words? Otherwise, we're going to end up being swayed by every wind and doctrine. We're going to run down every rabbit hole. And I am so tired of rabbit holes because discerning Christians don't know what is God and what is not God. We have to grow up. When we're having milk, when we're not having solid food, it's the responsibility of our parents to feed us. But the moment that you start eating, you've got to feed yourself. You look at a child. You sit the child down at the, at the dining room table. You give them an knife and fork. And you say, feed yourself. And when they haven't had enough, you go and encourage them to eat more. But we've got to feed ourselves. And in the same way, friends, we've got to spiritually feed ourselves. It is vital that we grow up. And the Bible says, for solid food is for the mature who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good and evil. They can see, is this God or isn't this God? They can discern, is this the spirit of man? Is this demonic or is it angelic? Because they are not babies. They have become spiritually continent. Now I want to talk about the soul. Because just as much as we've got to become physically continent, we've got to become spiritually continent. We've got to be emotionally continent. The soul is made up of your reasoning or thinking. It's made up of your will, it's made up of your feelings and your emotions, and it's made up of your imagination. And we have to become mature 
in our fantasy world, in our imagination. Remember, the canvas of your imagination is there as a window into the third heaven. And when that canvas is opened into the second heaven, you will become depressed, tormented, and, and bugged by the enemy. And you've got to shut that off and open it into the third heaven that you can hear what God is saying. My friends, too many people are operating in the second heaven, being prophetic words from the second heaven, which are always fear-driven. Remember what God is in, there's always hope. Or they, they are being bombarded by that which is occultic, soulish, lustful, demonic, tormenting, because they've got their canvas opened in the wrong realm. Don't be under it, friends. Reposition yourself. And then we see the, the picture of our emotions and our feelings, which is also part of the soul. Now, a person that is emotionally, is, that whose soul is incontinent, is swayed from the left to right. They are bipolar. They swing from one place to the other. They're up, then they're down. They're high, then they're low. They get swayed by every wind of doctrine. They've got no revelation of being self-controlled, of becoming continent. Their imagination goes everywhere. They feed their imagination because they keep imagining, thinking upon the wrong things. The Bible says that if you imagine something, you will think on it. If you think about it, you will feel it. If you feel it, you'll become it. If you imagine, excuse me, <coughs> that you're the redeemed of, this, of, of, of Christ, that you're a son of God, that you are the son of God called in this time to rise up in your maturity. Excuse me. <coughs> you will think about what is true, what is lovely. You will think according to Philippians 4 verse 8. You will let your thoughts be occupied by that which is truth, which is God, which is Holy Spirit. And if you think it, you will feel it. You will start operating in the feelings of, of the God. You will start feeling God's feelings. That's what the Holy Spirit does. He gives us the, the opportunity to actually feel the Father's emotions. And that's why so many people feel emotional. They laugh or they cry or they grieve or they pick up what heaven is feeling because they have got their spirit tuned into the third heaven, to God. If your spirit is tuned into the second heaven, friends, you're going to feel darkness. You're going to feel depressed. You're going to feel suicidal. You're going to feel hatred. You're going to feel criticism. You're going to feel what the second heaven is full of. But you're not going to connect to the third heaven. And if you feel it, you will become it. You will become whatever you imagine. Tomorrow's destiny is rooted in today's thoughts, friends. What are you thinking? What are you believing? What are you imagining? What are you feeling? Because God is wanting us to, to become continent in our soul. We have to take responsibility for our soul, friends. We have to take responsibility. David regularly spoke to his soul. Why are you downcast, oh my soul? Put your trust in God. I want to tell you now, a mature Christian does not lie down and get depressed and get everybody stroking their depression, feeling sorry for them and dragging them to be able to lie there in that bed feeling miserable. A, a man and a woman of God speaks to their soul and says, soul, what have you opened yourself up to that you feel like this? Sort your life out. And we've got to rise up, friends, and see things differently. I told you that I might say things that offend you. My heart is not to offend you. My heart is to grow you up. So please just listen without getting offended and receive truth because God is releasing truth and he's wanting you to see. It is vital that we protect our imagination. It is vital that we protect our hearts. I've, I've, I've shared with many, I went through deliverance for five major big demons in my early years as a Christian. And since that moment, I have guarded my imagination. I will not open my imagination again for the devil to have the legal right. My friends, if you open it again, he comes back seven times stronger. And we have to understand when he finds a house clean and he will come back and he will look. The Bible says in 1 Peter 5 verse 8, your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. He's looking for a way to come in, friends. And if you open up that window again, or the door again, and you let him in, he's going to come back seven times stronger. I have guarded my mind, my imagination, my feelings, and my emotions from the day that I went through deliverance. I do not watch anything that's going to open up those doors again. I do not, be, I do not be partake of anything that's going to open up those doors again. I've taken responsibility for my soul, friends. Because God wants us to be spirit-led, 
not fleshly and not soul led. And this course is about getting a revelation that we actually have the ability to take control of our souls. We have the authority, the ability, and the anointing to bring our soul into full um, continence. And God is calling us to do that. We will not cope. We will not cope with what's coming to this world, what's already here and what's going to increase if we do not spiritually and emotionally grow up. And God is calling us to do that, friends. And I want to encourage you, do not stop. The Bible says in Proverbs 4, verse 23, guard your heart, your imagination, guard it, because it is the wellspring of life. What goes through your imagination becomes part of who you are. It's not okay, friends, to open your imagination to things that are taking a hold of your thought life, taking a hold of your feelings, and establishing who you become. Jesus said, the Ten Commandments says, if you've done this, if you do it, you're guilty. Jesus said, if you think it, you're guilty. If you think it, if you think it, if you imagine it and you think it, you are guilty. My friends, I want to tell you, under grace, we have a greater responsibility. Because under grace, we have responsibility for our thought patterns. And why do you think it's so important? Because Jesus says in the end times, Matthew 24, the greatest onslaught in the end time is going to be deception. And I must probably talk a little bit about that more next week. Um, but that deception is a bombardment on the mind, friends. And if you do not have a continent mind, if you haven't learned how to take your thoughts captive, the Bible says the weapons of our warfare are mighty for the pulling down of strongholds. We make things obedient and we cast things out. We are accountable for every thought that goes into our head. And when we have a thought that comes from the enemy and we come into agreement with it, it's just become our thought. Friends, he can say what he likes. He can throw at you what you like. But do not come into agreement with it. How do you come into agreement? By repenting for it? You've just said, well, it's mine. By pondering on it, by thinking about it, by allowing it access to your mind, we have to take authority over that which comes against us. We have to say, that's not me, I'm not having it. Be like Mickey Mouse. This is my imagination and you can't have it. That was the most powerful thing I've ever seen. If I knew it was going to be so powerful, I would have videoed it because I would have loved to have shown it a million times already to every person that I teach on, on the mind. So if we imagine you are the center of the universe, then you will believe and perceive everything from the aspect of what's happening to me. It's all about me. You know, there's that joke that says um, a person that was suffering from rejection was watching rugby. And the next moment they scrummed and they got up and they said, why is everybody talking about me? Well, the truth of the matter is if you are incontinent emotionally, if you are selfish, self-centered, and everything is always about you, you are going to misinterpret everything that's happening around you. You're going to read everything through the eyes of what's happening to me, why are people doing this to me. It's always going to be to me, for me, and around me. And friends, I want to tell you now, you will misinterpret everything and you will read it wrong. I always say to people, from the moment you say, God, here am I, use me, it's not about you anymore. You don't have the privilege to say it's all about me. Because from that second onwards, it's about other people. And we've lost the privilege of me. If you look at the picture that I, I gave you um, here where I talk about incontinent, um, you can see it's a picture of me. But we've got to learn to see what's in the center of that. And in the center of that picture, it's all about you. And God is changing perspective in our lives. Um, people that are incontinent, selfish, self-centered, and love conditionally are people that have an emotional IQ that has been stunted or immature. Because people can grow on the outside, they can grow in age, they can grow in years, they can even grow spiritually. But if their emotions don't grow at the same rate as their age, they will have an EQ of a child, even though they are old on the outside. People can be 60, 70, or 80 years old and still be a child. Because their EQ is the age of a 5-year-old, a 10-year-old, or a 12-year-old. And God has to grow us up. He has to mature our EQ so that our emotional intelligence is the same age as our physical intelligence and our mental intelligence. You see, my friends, it's not your IQ that will determine how successful you are in life. 
There are many brilliant people that have not been able to make it in life because their EQ has stunted them. And God wants us to grow up in our EQ. The definition for an emotional intelligence, otherwise known as an emotional potion or an EQ, is the ability to understand, use, and manage your emotions in positive ways to relieve stress, communicate effectively, empathize with others, overcome challenges, and diffuse conflict. That is the anointing of a mature EQ. If we are younger than our physical age, there are several reasons why our EQ gets stunted. The first one, and this is the most tragic one, because we're living in a time, friends, where people have stopped disciplining their children. And we're going to see more and more people raised up with an emotional EQ way beyond their years. If a person grew up spoiled, indulged, and was never trained to take responsibility or accountability, they will grow up physically, but not emotionally. And they will not be able to cope in life because their EQ is too small, is too young. If a person experiences a trauma or a shock as a child, for example, the death or the divorce of a parent, a terrible accident, abuse, physical or sexual abuse, or verbal abuse, if they never had someone to help them work through this, emotionally they will become stunted at the age that the things happened. This results in them reverting back to childish behavior every time they face a difficult moment, a trauma, a stress, or any other life's pressures. An emotionally incontinent person will behave, will behave like a child, will be childish, not childlike. God wants us to be childlike, uncomplicated. But they will be childish emotionally and be given in any stress, a stressful situation. They will react, they will not respond. And I'm just going to mention some of the ways that they react. Number one, they sulk. You know what sulking is? It's emotionally cutting people off until you get what you want. It is emotional blackmail. They cut everybody off. They sit there in a heap. They feel sorry for themselves. They get everybody running after them so that they can get what they want. It is evil, it's demonic, and it is a manipulation. And only childish people sulk. People that are mature in the things of God and know and control their emotions do not sulk. They communicate, they speak about things, and they find solution to it. They bring an end to conflict, friends. And there are too many people that go around the same mountain. Things never change because every time there's a crisis, they go back to their have themselves in a corner and the same pattern happens over and over again. And should anyone dare to challenge it, they will be offended and they will storm off and they will have another childish behavior pattern. The next thing is brooding. The first thing I want to say to all parents, don't send your children to the room to think about things. You are creating and establishing a brooder. Brooding is the exact counterfeit of meditating. Meditating is thinking upon the word of God, the things of God, and allowing that to become part of you as you think over it, you, you consider it, you, you take that and you make it life within you. Brooding is thinking about the last thing that's just happened. And you're giving it life. You think about what you could have said, what you would have said, what you should have said. The thing gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Your imagination goes on in tangents. You think about the next time I'm, I see them, this is, I'm going to give them a piece of my mind. When you're giving away so many pieces of mind, there's very little left. And you brood over it. And wherever there's brooding, there's tormenting demons. They always come to a brooder. It always draws depression. It always draws fear. And at the end of the day, you're sitting there feeling sorry for yourself, brooding on a problem, making it bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, and you're not allowing the Spirit of God to minister to you. Brooding is incredibly evil. It is the counterfeit of meditating. God gave us the gift of meditation, and the enemy counterfeited it because it's exactly the same process. It's thinking about and giving it life. You either give the Word of God life, or you give the problem to life. And then we wonder why so many people are needing medication. Because they have opened their mind up and said to the enemy, you're welcome to have this mind as your mind. Do what you like. Because I've opened the door and I've welcomed you in. <clears throat> the next thing is temper tantrums. 
death tantrums on incontinent soul. It's like someone who poos everywhere and covers everything with poo anytime they want to. Temper tantrums demand attention. It also operates with fear. If I can get you scared of me because I shout and I scream and I do all these terrible things to get you fearful so that I can have what I want, that's what a temper tantrum is. And I want to confess one of the things that I had to be delivered of was a spirit of rage. I knew all about temper tantrums. I used to call them passion. I'm just a passionate person. Until one day Jesus said to me, really, Kathy, is that passion or is it just rage? And I want to tell you, friends, from the day that God challenged me and I repented for my rage, he set me free of a demon of rage because rage is a demon. Do not go to sleep on your problems. Do not, on your anger, do not give the devil a foothold. And if you're having temper tantrums, it's because you've given your soul to the enemy, to a spirit of rage, and you've given freedom to do what he wants to do. My friends, it's an incontinent soul. And God says he cannot work with a person that has an incontinent soul because they never do. <coughs> Excuse me. They never do things differently. A crisis comes, they have a tantrum, everybody gets nervous. You either, either cover up and never talk about it again. <coughs> Excuse me, because people don't want another tantrum. And you carry on as if nothing's happened. It's an incontinent soul. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> and we've got to take responsibility for it. And I want to say to parents, don't allow your children to have temper tantrums. But they just scream louder. Well then... Hold them accountable until they realize that they have an incontinent soul and they've got to take responsibility for it. When is it the right time to start training your children not to have temper tantrums? The very first day they have them. Doesn't matter what age they are. They're not okay. That is not the way that we manipulate people to get our own way. By screaming, shouting, performing and behaving like a brat. We have to take control of our emotions. And God is wanting us to see things differently. Remember, friends, we can never change anything if we just allow the same emotional immaturity to keep operating over and over and over and over again in our lives. And we say it's okay because this is who I am. No, it's not who you are. You are stunted. You've become retarded in the area of your emotions. That is not who you are. That is not who God created you to be. That is just damage that's been done to your soul. Oh, you never had the right trainers in the first place to bring you into the fullness of who God has created you to be. It's vital that we take responsibility, take accountability, that we allow the truth to set us free, friends, because God is looking for a people that are like him. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. The Bible tells us regularly, Jesus felt emotion, but never once. Did he act on emotion? And even when he went into the temple and he saw what was happening there, and the Bible says he was angry. Now, if you look at the, at the Gospels, one Gospel says a little bit more. They say Jesus went and he plaited a whip. Now, I want to ask you, friends, why did he plait a whip? He walked into somewhere where there were animals everywhere. Wherever there were animals, people were standing with whips. They were controlling their animals with whips. Why did Jesus go and plait a whip? Because he felt an emotion and he had to go and hear the Spirit of God to find out what God wanted him to do. The Bible says Jesus never sinned. He experienced everything and he never sinned. And my friends, in that moment, he did not react out of anger. I did a study on that a while ago and it says that plaiting a whip takes from six hours to, nine, to three days. So I don't know what size whoop he plaited, and I don't know how long the whoop was, how big the whoop was, but it could have been anywhere from six hours to three days. Why did he do that? He didn't need a whoop. He needed time. He needed to pick up the heart of God. He needed to move from that emotional place into the spiritual place. And he went back without any anger, and he just threw everything out, and he said, this isn't going to happen. And my friends, I want to tell you now, when we are able to take control of our soul, we are able to go back and say, actually, this isn't going to happen because we do not operate 
from a tempotism, we operate from a place of the spirit rising up and taking full control. Another way <coughs> that we operate and, and, and behave emotionally immature is when we attack the characters of other people. You see, friends, and I'm going to be talking about this a little bit more too, maybe next week. If I come to you and I want something and you say no, and the moment that you say no and you stand against me, and I then turn around and I attack your character, what am I doing? I am wanting my own way, and if I can't get it one way, I'm going to get it another way. If I then say, well, you're just a nasty, self-centered, wada, 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 and I attack your character, and I belittle you, and I cut you down, and I bring you to nothing, what have I just done? I have allowed the enemy to use my mouth to break down your character and personality purely for self-centered and selfish reasons, so that I can get what I want. And my friends, the truth of the matter is a hurting person does that. But they're never satisfied until they've hurt other people. And that's what's so tragic. And they never deal with conflict. Because every time they do, they just respond in the same way. I'm going to be talking a little bit more about that. And the other one, the other childish behavior, is to punish people by withholding love, affection, or intimacy from them. All gifts. I know of situations where, where a person would give a gift, a beautiful gift. And then the first time that they were upset or they felt that um, they weren't getting their own way, they would come and remove the gift and take it away and say, you don't deserve that. You see, that is emotional immaturity and that's punishment. And my friends, we can't allow these things to, to operate. And I've just given you a few examples. I'm sure there's more. God is wanting us to see things with new eyes, friends. And we don't stroke sin. Sin has to be revealed. It's got to come into the light so that we can repent. We don't condemn it. It's not condemning. It's just revelation. If we get revelation, 50% of healing is just getting revelation. My people perish because they have no knowledge, they have no vision, they have no revelation. So when you get revelation, you can go, oh my goodness, now I recognize what it is. I can now deal with it. And God is wanting us to, to grow up emotionally that we can unshakably become the sons of God that he has called us to be. All of these traits are very obvious to people watching. Our reaction to everything in life is always dependent on how emotionally continent we are. And to anybody watching us, the, these, these traits are incredibly obvious. But to us, they are our normal. And because they're normal to us, they become a blind spot. And the trouble with a blind spot is everybody can see you've got it, but you can't. And the moment that somebody points out there's a blind spot, the offense rises up again and the pattern just repeats itself. And God is wanting to deal with our blind spots. You see, a, a child will sort themselves. They are demanding. They will revert back to childish behavior. They demand attention right now. There's always a reaction instead of a response. And there's always chaos in their life. Why? Because every time you behave in a pattern that is emotionally immature, you open the door for the demonic realm to come in. But when you operate from the spirit then the kingdom of heaven, the atmosphere of the kingdom of heaven has to be established. The kingdom of heaven is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. The kingdom of heaven is within you. And when we operate out of the spirit, we release the kingdom of heaven into our atmosphere. And that is why some people's lives are so peaceful and other people's lives are always chaos. They go from one crisis to another crisis to another crisis. And it's not because they've got more crises than other people have. It's because they don't know how to manage them. Uh, maturity means allowing people to train us, to take responsibility. Remember the Bible says the mature train themselves. There's a training that has to happen. There's responsibility. There's accountability. There's correction. Friends, we have to be open to correction without exploding, without going back to the same patterns. And there is a knowing who we are. None of what I've just described now is anybody's personality. None of that is personality. All of that is immaturity in the area of feelings and emotions. The little picture I've got for you on page seven shows such a lovely picture. We've got to grow in five areas. We've got to grow in self-control. We've got to become, it calls it self-regulation here. We've got to become self-continent. That will cause us 
to have more self-awareness of ourselves and of other people, which will result in becoming incredibly motivated. You know, friends, anyone that lives in chaos just wants to give up. They don't want to do anything. But when there's order, there's always a motivation that comes in. Out of that, you will discover you've got an incredible deep empathy. Now, the difference between sympathy and empathy, sympathy means you jump in their pit with you and you never help them out. Empathy means I can understand the sad situation. Let me help you out of that. And God doesn't want us to have sympathy. He wants us to have empathy. He wants us to take people out of darkness into his marvelous light. And the result of that is that we have better social skills. You see, friends, when you know how to control your emotions, then you are far, far, far more able to be able to deal with and help with and walk with other people. But if every time there's any crises in your life and you have an awful down, you've got no social skills because you can't go beyond yourself. Now, the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And love your neighbor as you love yourself. Everything starts with our relationship of how we love Father and how we love ourselves. Jesus says that's the greatest commandment. We have to fall more and more in love with our Father. And we have to allow him to come and permeate deep within our hearts so that we can be happy about who we are. You see, friends, emotionally immature people are not happy people. They haven't found themselves and they haven't found their peace. They live in a permanent cycle of guilt because they feel guilt every time that they've had an all fall down. And then they just feel a little bit better. And then the next thing happens and they back into that pattern of guilt again. And God has to break that. Now, there are some things that are fundamentally true for all people. And so in the journey of discovering who we are, it's really important to know the fundamental common things that every one of us have. If anger is not your personality, if sulking is not your personality, if brooding is not your personality, and you've got to get rid of all those things that you have made your own and received to be who you are, then it's really important that we let go of it so that we can know who we truly have been created to be. Now, the first thing I want you to know is just to go back to Genesis. And in Genesis 1 verse 26 to 30, it says, God said, let us make man in our image, let them look like us, and in our likeness, let them be like us, and let them have dominion, let them rule over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, over the cattle, over the earth, and over every creation, over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth, so that, so God created man in his own image, and in his image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. Um, and God blessed them, and God said to them, be fruitful, and multiply, and replenish the earth. Now, I want to tell you this, friends. God has blessed us. Remember, I told you, we've got to have hope. Hope, hope, hope. Hope that good things are going to come, come for us. God has blessed us. The sons of God are blessed. And it's really important we know that. Because everything that happens around our lives is for us and not to us. So change your perspective. Because God is wanting to, if you can say, this is for me, God, and I'm blessed. And I have hope. Suddenly, life will look very differently. Um... And he said to them, be fruitful and multiply, replenish the earth, and subdue it, conquer it, bring it into bondage, and dominate it. And have dominion, which means rule and reign over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. And God said, behold, I am giving you every herb bearing seed, which is upon the face of the earth, and every tree in which is the fruit of the tree, yielding seed, if to, uh, to you it shall be for your meat, and to every beast of the earth, and to every fowl of the air, and to everything that creeps upon the earth, whereupon there is life, I have given every green herb for meat. And God said to Adam and Eve, I have created you, I have blessed you, you look like me, friends, we are made body, soul, and spirit, which means we are three in one, just like the Father is, we look like him, and that is why we are the only thing that was ever created in the image of God, nothing else looks like him, and the likeness, which means we can do what he does, and God said, I've created you like this, because I'm looking for family, friends. And the first thing I want you to know that is a common foundation to everybody is that we are all called to be family. 
We are all called to be team. And I just want to show you this little picture. So we are born completely selfish, self-centered. We live in a place of conditional love, and it's all about me. And God takes us on a journey where he says, Kathy, I've got to change your perspective and I've got to change your mindset because I never created you to be selfish, self-centered, and self-focused. I created you to be like me. And everything about God is about we. From the moment God introduces himself, he introduces himself as Elohim, the multiple God. Over 2,000 times we hear about Elohim, the almighty multiple God. And he talks in plural because God is we, friends. He's not me. And the, the one that operates as me, all about me, independent spirit, is not our Father in heaven. And God wants us to change perspective. It's all about team. It's all about we. It's all about them. <coughs> That's why I repeatedly say, from the moment that you say, here I am, Lord, use me. It's not about you anymore. Excuse me. <coughs> it's about who you are as part of the team as part of the body of Christ and what your role is in a much bigger thing and friends we have to shift and we've got to see things differently each person in the team called God had their own role their own desire yet they submitted their role to each other Jesus in the garden of Gethsemane said this he said, God, let this cup pass from me, but not my will, but your will be done. Jesus had his own will. He's got his own will. He's got his own right to make decisions on his own. He's got his own right to say, yes or no, this is what I want and this is what I don't want. But Jesus said this of himself. Jesus gave this answer in John 5, verse 19 and 30. Truly, I tell you, the Son of Man can do nothing by himself. He can do only what he sees his Father doing. Because whatever the father does, the son also does. Now I want to tell you, that wasn't because he couldn't, it's because he wouldn't. He knew that he was part of a team and he was always going to be functioning as part of that team. By myself, I can do nothing. I judge only what I hear and my judgment is just. For I seek not to please myself, but him who has sent me. Matthew 26 verse 39 is where he said in the garden of Gethsemane, he says, not my will, but your will be done. In John 6 verse 13 to 14, but when he, the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. He shall not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears um, me telling him. Oh, sorry, I've lost the page. Yeah. What he hears, he will tell you of what's yet to come. He shall glorify me because it is for me that he will receive what will be known, made known to you. Now the Holy Spirit will only ever, ever do what Jesus did. And Jesus will only ever do what the Father did. You cannot come in between those three and manipulate them. You cannot separate them. You cannot bully them. You cannot sulk until you get your own way. You cannot be childish. Because everything that the three of them do is three in one. Now the Holy Spirit also has a will, friends. It says in 1 Corinthians 12 verse 11. For these are the, the one and the same Spirit. And he distributes to each one the gifts as he determines or as he wills. When it comes to what he does within his own capacity, he has his own will, friends. But he refuses to let his will violate Jesus. And Jesus refuses to let his will violate the Father. And friends, that's what being a team is all about. <clears throat> being a team means you belong. It means you have a part to play. It means you function better because emotionally it's healthier to be part of a team than to be on your own. We create a flow together. We work as part and we respect each other. Any person who says they don't need other people, any person that's independent, individual, and always doing their own thing is truly and really a broken-hearted person with a very low emotional EQ. And we are in a time where God is wanting to shine the spotlight 
on the areas in our life that he's wanting to bring healing. And friends, we have to be honest. We have to be real with ourselves. We can't defend sin. Every time you defend your temper tantrum, every time you defend, and I can say this because I've been there, done that, got the t-shirt. Every time you defend your sulking, every time you defend your brooding, every time you defend your independent spirit, every time you defend that which God calls sin, you've given the enemy another legal right because you've just said to him, I'm coming into agreement with you and you are in charge. But when we are humble enough, friends, to just say, I recognize it, I see it, I recognize it all this time, I've been giving the enemy a right to my life. I'm so sorry. In that moment, God can start the healing process that he so wanted to do. I think my time is up because um, I said to you that um, it's quarter past eight. But I can't follow my time on the clock because I've had to start three times. I hope that Victoria is going to be able to help me put it all together. The next thing that's common for every single person. So friends, the first thing is we're all part of a team. The second thing is, and, and, and the biggest thing with a broken hearted person is that they can't become a team player. And that's why divorce is so high. The incidence of divorce is so high. That's why so many relationships break up. That's why so many families fall, fall apart. Because self-centered, selfish people that love conditionally come together and they want it to be all about them. And so there is this incredible war that goes on. And then they part, but they don't allow anybody to teach them how to become a team and how to become interlinked and how to walk together together. You see, friends, being a team doesn't mean we agree on everything. Being a team doesn't mean that we think the same. Being a team doesn't mean that we do things the same. It means that we've learned to grow up within ourselves and we've learned how to honor and respect each other. That's what being a team is all about. And just like Jesus, we learn to submit one to the other so that the best for the team can manifest. The next thing is love. Every person was created in love for love by love himself god is love <laughs> he is love there's absolutely nothing else that he can be but love he oozes love you break open the chocolate called god and all that comes out is pure chocolate i wish chocolate logs weren't taken off the market talking about chocolate he is pure love we were all created to love and to be loved mankind flourishes when they are affectionately touched they have done so many experiments that children that are touched a lot, affectionately touched, and I'm talking about affectionately touched and loved and hugged, flourish so much better. And they establish, they are emotionally established. And those that are not touched friends are emotionally broken and do not establish. Affection is vital. The word for affection is agape. The Bible says in 1 John 4 verse 8 to 16, Whoever does not agape, does not affectionately love, does not know God, for God is love. So many people say, well, I'm not affectionate, I'm not demonstrative. Well, the truth of the matter is you haven't met the affectionate demonstrative one. Your heart's broken. You've just experienced rejection and abandonment, and you've sealed your heart off, and now you think that's normal. No, it's not normal, friends. It's brokenness, and God wants to break that. So that we come back to be like him. We were created to be like him. And I want to tell you there's nothing more affectionate and demonstrative than God. And you know that the moment that you start encountering his spirit. He's incredibly affectionate and demonstrative. He loves cuddling. He loves touching. He loves feeling. He loves us to feel him. He's incredibly affectionate and demonstrative. And the more we get to know him, the more the wall around our heart falls off and breaks down. And he releases that affection, that agape love in and through every one of us. It goes on in verse 16 and says, And so we know and rely on the love God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in him. A person who cannot give or receive affection has a broken heart, friends. And they are emotionally stunted. And God wants to release that. I just want to talk quickly about unconditional love and conditional love. <clears throat> love is not an emotion. It's a decision. We don't love with feelings, friends. If we love with feelings, it's just that little spark. It's like the match head that lights. It's just the eros that gets it all going. But beyond that, 
that eros love does because it just it's just there to ignite the, the, the match but what happens beyond that is a choice friends it's a decision to love and to keep on loving now conditional love is all about me and we're living in a world that's full of conditional love we're living in a world where people are selfish self-centered love and conditionally and they it's all about them their whole focus it's all about them conditional love says this you are here for me you belong to me you become a possession to somebody you're not somebody that they treasure you are here to bless me to please me to serve me to fulfill me to make me look good when you no longer please me i no longer have need of you therefore you have to go we're living in a world where people don't love each other where they lust after each other and where they possess each other and when god is coming to his children he's wanting to restore his love back into the hearts of his children he's wanting to restore family friends he's wanting to restore what the enemy has worked very hard to destroy the enemy has been blatantly trying to destroy families if you destroy a family you destroy a nation and the spirit of god the love of god the power of god in this last day is to restore families he is family he's the father of a family and he wants to restore his family what does it mean to have unconditional love because that's the love that the father has the first thing about conditional love it stops the moment you displease somebody that's when they punish you unconditional love says i love you no matter who you are what you're doing and or how how bad you've been i love you no matter what your choices we see the fullness of the unconditional love as the father is waiting for the prodigal son what is unconditional love it's god saying i love you we don't have to serve we don't have to earn it we don't have to do anything to get it we don't have to strive you see wherever there's conditional love there's a lot of striving because constantly you've got to please that person to be in their good will but then they've got to do it to you as well because you've got conditional love but unconditional love says i love you i love you i love you when you're strong i love you when you're weak I love you when you're good. I love you when you're bad. I love you when you're sick. I love you when you're healthy. I love you when you're overweight. I love you when you're skinny. I love you. My love for you is unconditional. You can do nothing to earn it and you can do nothing to make it more. I love you. That's the love that God has got for us, friends. And as we fall in love with God and as we get to know Him better, we start understanding the heart of a father that loves unconditionally and when my heart is filled with the unconditional love of the father the overflow of that heart is unconditional love for others friends and god is looking for a people that can love the way he does we were created in his image and likeness we ooze affection we ooze it if our hearts are whole friends we ooze love when our hearts are whole because the god of love permeates through us we were made in love for love by love and love is the very fiber of our being when our hearts are whole and god is looking for people whose hearts are whole and because i love you unconditionally and i love him unconditionally you can't disappoint me because my love is not conditional to how much you please me because i put no hope in you i just pour my love out for you and the response of that is that people love us back friends and people know when they love when you love them and I, and god is calling us to rise up into the fullness of mature love not to be the broken people where it's all about me but to have the heart that says i love you because i love you because i love you and i'm going to go the extra mile for you and friends marriages that are built on unconditional love will not fall apart marriages that are built on conditional love will fall apart because when you let me down i'm not going to stay here anymore and so we have to understand i'm going to punish you i'm going to hurt you and i'm not going to be there for you because you don't fulfill me i can't own you anymore unconditional love doesn't want to own anybody everybody and everything belongs to god we just want to pour out what he's given us for other people and it's the most amazing wonderful thing so god is calling us to learn to love unconditionally as we grow in him we'll grow in love the focus changes completely it's all about him therefore it's it's all about you i'm here to serve him therefore i'll do what i have to for you i think that's as far as i can go tonight friends i don't want to rush this i've got much more to say 
but I don't want to rush this, but what I, I think I've said enough to start stirring up something in your heart to say, there's some things I need to deal with. There's some things that I need to start looking at in my, excuse me, in my life, because God is wanting to bring change. Um, I want to ask you, please, for homework, because you've got homework, to look at page 29. And the homework is this. I want you to spend time this week getting to know God better. Ask the Father to baptize you with the abundant Father's love, establishing you as his son. Romans 8.15 says, For you, we did not receive a spirit that makes us a slave again to fear, but we received the spirit of sonship, and by him we cry, Abba, Father. Ask him to show you your blind spots, friends. Ask him to highlight areas of arrest in your emotional development. Ask him to help you to forgive yourself. Ask him to help you to forgive others. Learn to know more about him. And have fun as you start having the adventure of seeing things differently. Um, I woke up one morning this week. And as I woke up the scripture, the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into it and are safe. And I kept singing that the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into him and they are safe. And as I sang that, I said, Lord, why have you put this in my heart? And God said, I want people to know me. I want them to know that I am who I say I am. I want them to know that my name is powerful. I want them to run into my name, into me, and to come and draw from me. My children don't come to me. And that is why they've lived so hurt and broken and disappointment, and disappointed. And so, friends, over the page, I've got a list of the names and titles of Jesus and the names of the Father. And I want you to look at that. The name of the Lord is a strong one. When you're feeling weak, friends, run into the strong one. The name of the Lord is the provider. Friends, when you're going through difficult times, don't look how to make money. Run into the provider. He will show you. He'll give you blueprints. He'll help you. The name of the Lord is he, that he, he's the one that heals us. Friends, if you're sick, don't run around looking for medicine and tablets. Run into the name of the one who heals you. The name of the Lord is holy, friends. The name of the Lord is Christ, it's helper. We need to run into God. We need to run into Jesus. We need to run into the lover of our soul. We need to run into love and soul. We need to run into the team called Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. This course is called Seeing Things, Seeing Life Through New Eyes. I trust tonight has been meaningful. I trust tonight has stretched you a little bit. I trust tonight has got you asking questions. If you've got questions for me, please ask on the on the group, the WhatsApp group, so that I can answer and everybody can see. If I don't know, I'll tell you I don't know, but I'll find the answer. But my prayer is, friends, it's time for the body of Christ, the bride of Christ, to grow up. Don't make apologies for immaturity and don't make apologies for sin. Face it. Look it straight in the face and say, you no longer have a right in my life because I am a child of God. Bless you, beautiful, beautiful friends. I'm so sorry this has been broken tonight. I'm trusting we could maybe put it all together and still get one teaching out of this. I love you. <laughs> I can't tell you how much I love you, every one of you. And my prayer and my delight and my passion is that you will get to know him more, get to know yourself more, so that you can be everything that he's called you to be. Good night. Bless you abundantly. And have a good week. Getting to know dad better. And letting him quickly just reveal those things. That you can just say, oops, sorry father. Sorry father. Teach me to be more like you. Good night and amen.